must be actively listening, as well as answering any polling questions on your screen. If you meet all of today's requirements, you will receive your certificate within two weeks. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Frank Bergoglio, Global Public Sector Strategist at SailPoint. Wes Dennington, Senior Director of Architecture at Ping Identity. Wade Ellery, Director of Solutions Architects and Senior Technical Evangelist at Radiant Logic. Rashad Stewart, Systems Engineering Director for US Public Sector at XBeam. And Matt Topper, President and Solutions Catalyst at Uber Ether, who will be moderating the event today. Matt, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Katie, as always. Um, so um, we really wanted to chat a little bit about some of the major changes in the identity access management and SOC space. I think over the, today, um, over the last few months, we've seen numerous supply chain attacks against the government publicly announced in the media. Um, things fresh as last week. Um, previously, many organizations focused on phishing and social engineering attacks, and even the OPM attack, um, which was almost 10 years ago now, came down to a lack of strong authentication and lateral movement within the networks. No matter what the attack vector has been over the last 10 years, um, one thing is consistent. Every single attacker, after they've breached the front door, immediately goes after the keys to the castle, the identity and access management systems. They know that they'll have a greater rate of success hitting their internal targets if they can gain access to the most privileged and sensitive accounts within an organization. For the last 20 years, we've been promising as security professionals to bring the real-time power uh, buried within our security operations center and the business visibility buried within our identity and access management centers to get systems together to create the pinnacle of protections for the organizations we serve. Uh, up until recently, a lot of that has been a pipe dream. Um, and a lot of promises without a lot of ability to show it working all together. Um, so today we wanna to talk about some major changes in those areas that the team here has brought to bear um, and talk uh, with some of the world's leading experts in cybersecurity to discuss how we're gonna strengthen your mission through identity centric security. So we've already done the introductions. Thank you, Katie. Um, so I'm gonna just lead it off with Frank. Um, we've known each other as long as this has been a topic, I think, um, and have always talked about the real-time data that gets trapped in the SOC and the value it brings uh, and can bring to the identity and access management world. Can you talk a little bit about how the world has changed in the last three, four or five years and how some of the tools are being used within identity and access management? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. And before that, you know, the identity tools have changed as well. Um, they've gotten smarter. You know, things we're doing with native change detection, for example, um, being able to trigger an event, a lifecycle event, when something in an authoritative source changes outside of the governance process is, is critical. Um, but then to extend that, right, um, out into the SIMSOR environment and being able to one, provide that context to the SOC analyst that's, that's you know, picked up an event in the queue and, you know, in most cases is not going to understand anything beyond the user ID that it's, he's looking at in the event that's occurred. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of um, integration um, bi-directional um, where the identity platform can enrich the security operations tool. Um, and then on the flip side, when that event occurs, um, it can trigger um, automatically or, or through, you know, the actions of a SOC analyst, um, the ability to, you know, trigger a lifecycle event, whether it's a deprovision, a, a, a removal of access, whatever it might be. So, you, you know, I think we're going to con continue to see more of this integration um, and, you know, the tools continue to get smarter. So um, this is absolutely critical. It's great to finally see this. You know, you go back, I think it's, it was longer than 10 years ago, Matt, um, you want to feel older, um, that we had this discussion way back when. And, you know, it, it's great to see it coming to fruition. Yeah, absolutely. The, the advancements in technology, the availability of the cloud services to be able to actually churn this data without organizations having to make major investments has been critical. Um, so Rashad, um, one of the benefits that Exabeam has brought to the identity and access management world is user behavior analytics. Uh, a lot of us in identity and access management, this is new. 
and things that are just starting to get applied in near real time. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, user and entity behavior analytics sure. and how you're seeing ICAM tools being used with it? Sure, thanks, Matt. So um, XRB specifically ingests both dynamic uh, data sources from event logs, threat intelligence, and leverages uh, identity attributes such as uh, user department role title as context from ICAM solutions. Uh, through the integration with those tools, XRB can um, collect and analyze uh, the data for a user or an asset to establish a rich profile and based on that for normal behavior. Um, once we've established that from a UEBA perspective within XRB, um, that normal behavioral uh, baseline, we can employ machine learning um, and statistical based uh, behavioral analytics across both the user and entity. Um, and we'll employ what we call session objects uh, to detect and score that abnormal activity um, that may suggest a user uh, compromise or other malicious activity. Um, within that session object, uh, anomalies in their scores are aggregated and reflected within a risk score. And this risk score can be used uh, in, the poly, in, in our policy uh, decision process, hooked in with the ICAM uh, tools, if you will, to decide to grant uh, you know, access, maybe prompt for additional authentication or even to block or suspend the user. So um, as we get further into this UEBA movement with um, you know, uh, zero trust architecture, et cetera, uh, you know, ICAM is going to be a, a, a you know, critical piece within, within UEBA. Yeah, we've, we have loved to see over the last year working with Exabeam, the ability that even on a person's first day with that peer group analysis that the tool does to be able to say, hey, based on what this person has access to, the attributes, what HR department they're part of, what contracts they're part of, this is how they should behave. So from day one, really getting that great profile and user and where they should be, even if we don't have a long-term history on them. Um, so Wade, um, we've joked that Radiant Logic um, has been the great connector for everything identity, whether it's web services, databases, LDAP, Active Directories in the back end, pushing all the way out to every single cloud environment, SaaS providers um, to synchronize that data. Um, can you talk a little bit how Radiant's been able to take some of that data that Rashad talked about and expose that for use within the ICAM tools? Yes, definitely. And, and that's a critical area. If you think of, of Exabeam and SailPoint and Ping as engines, they, they consume identity data as fuel. They need to have that information available at the speed of decision, and they need to have it accurate, and they need to have it span the, the enterprise. If you're looking at one small piece of the organization, you're not seeing the big picture. So what Radiant Logic provides you is that one place to go to get all the identity information correlated, aggregated, normalized, and available in a common format across each of the different platforms that's consuming it. So you're building policy based on the same data you're making access decisions about based on the same data you're using for risk scoring. So it's critical that information be accurate to change in the environment, but also be able to be delivered in exactly the way that it's needed. But in addition to that, if you're running authentication and authorization traffic from ping through Radiant to the backend sources, that information is also logged in our access logs. We can feed that over to Exabeam, who can now both see transactional information from the log side, plus a full rich profile of information add those together and then apply the policies in the sale point environment for control over that, feed that up to ping. And you've got a holistic environment here where the same data is being used everywhere, but optimized for each endpoints requirements. Yeah, it's, uh, I've really enjoyed watching as soon as somebody appears on a watch list inside of Exabeam, right? Somebody that has a blocked account that might be blocked at the VPN, those appearing on groups that immediately are being surfaced through Radiant Logic and then being taken advantage of by ping. So you might be getting a user blocked at the VPN and then immediately they go try and log in. They realize they're blocked there and they immediately try and go log in directly through ping through a web interface and then they're already locked, right? There's no second, third, fourth, fifth chance and they keep hopping around your environment. So um, Wes, ping has acted, the, acted as the front door for how many billions of users uh, accessing their corporate networks as well as internet services, um, as well as, um, which I, I don't think a lot of people realize, not only for human users, but non-person entities and services and APIs behind the scenes. Um, can you talk about some of the trends Ping has seen in access security 
um, and some of the emerging capabilities that we're seeing as orgs move towards zero trust and start bringing in some of these concepts? Sure. So, I mean, one of the things I think that's really heartening to me is that the level of maturity as people are starting to think about zero trust is rising. So I think to a lot of people, what zero trust means is zero implied trust that there's always a control point, you know, gating access to any resource. And that access could be, as you said, human or machine or script. Um, so that there's always an explicit authorization decision that takes into account as many of the factors that we've just talked about as you think makes sense in your scenario. But then they also sort of start walking back from there. So it's like, well, yes, I want to involve a bunch of, you know, good authorization and contextual factors, UEBA, et cetera. But do I have a good sense of what the roles this person is supposed to be have access to, to make my authorization decision? And then once you've got that, it's like, well, am I actually confident that the person authenticated properly? Because obviously if they're using an insecure authentication method, then once again, all the roles and you know, things like that start falling down. And then finally, you know, even in the workforce and government, we see how confident am I really that this identity is really who they say they are? So it, it's really just building that, you know, layers and layers of trust up so you can make those intelligent informed decisions to balance off, you know, the usability and the security. Yeah. <laughs> the amount of factors that Ping is able to bring to the table to, right, not only pulling from stack variables from the back end, whether those are roles and entitlements that have been given, dynamic variables from things like Exabeam or even from the devices and behaviors of those devices and locations in the world, bringing that all together, being able to make those sub millisecond decisions right. and do this authorization. It's truly quite amazing. All of that coming together so quickly in the Bing engines. So I think that gets a little bit into some of um, what I wanted to talk about next is uh, we're bringing the SOC world and the identity worlds together, exposing this data, um, in really near real time with huge sets of data that are coming together. If you think about all of the logs that are going across your stock, all of the lateral movement, people pseudoing, going from server to server, um, and then being able to make those decisions in real time. I guess for everybody, can you talk a little bit about the technology and um, shifts in the market that are allowing us to actually make the leap to this next level so quickly? I'll take a little bit of that to start with. One of the things that I've been really happy about the industry in general is we've moved more and more towards standards, that, that every vendor out there is, is adopting standards and that allows us to communicate much more easily than the old days of either a black box or some obscure API that had to be customized for every implementation. So the capability of moving this data around the environment and sharing it between applications, the, the four of us is an excellent example, we can do pretty much out of the box. So this isn't a, a three-year uh, professional services integration scenario. This is a product ready to integrate. We talk to each other already natively. And now you're just looking at how do I collect the information? How do I process it? And then in what way do I want to present it and most effectively at the highest rate and speed that I can deliver? Because as Wes mentioned, you're, you're making millisecond decisions. You don't want to put a a delay in the user's authentication authorization process, but you want to enhance your security. So being able to integrate quickly, deliver that information exactly as it's needed, and then again, feed it everywhere, um, it really is a benefit of this new set of standards that we're all able to adopt and implement, it makes this much easier to do. Yeah, if I may. Um, so I think, actually, should we wait for the question to be answered or? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, I think everyone has seen that just popped up. Uh, what percentage, looking for everyone in the audience to get an idea as we move on here, but what percentage of your total digital assets, whether that be web applications, mobile applications, services and APIs um, with federated access through your existing, what percentage is federated for access through your existing identity and access management technology stack? Would love to get an idea of the folks on the phone well, on the virtual phone, I guess we'll call it, uh, as to how protected your organizations are today. Um, so we can drive some of the discussion later. So go ahead, Wes. So I think you know, I was going to elaborate a little bit on what Wade said is, because one of the things we also hear is, 
Um, I'm not getting any more identity and security people, and um, you know they're they're getting harder and harder in demand, and we're we're paying them really well, and you know, but how do we put the decisions and, and the ability to build things in front of the people who are maybe the most natural, rather than requiring everything to be gated through security in cases where it doesn't make sense. So, we I think we've all invested massively in making our tools easier to use and in quicker time to value, so that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can build the widgets and then have business people where appropriate build the policies. And the funny thing is, is that once you've got these things available as easily consumable chunks, people tend to use them more and use them more effectively. So this raises the security water level, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just think of, you know, secure cross-demand identity management, the skin protocol that makes it very easy for all of us to integrate basically. Um, that has taken, you know, the integration of the identity ecosystem, like Matt said, or, or Wade said, what used to take years now takes minutes. Um, platforms, whether they're SaaS or on-premise, um, have matured now where they're wizard-driven configuration. I mean, you know, 10 years ago at, at a certain vendor I worked for, there was a lot of coding that, that went into that um, connector and, you, you know, the, the operations um, for identity management. And, and now we think, my God, I can bring up a wizard and configure the app and configure policies and the attributes I want to share and where I want to put them and, and how I want it audited and policies. You, you know, that just didn't exist before. Um, and then take it to the next level um, with artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and the analytics that we're able to do on, on peer group analysis and access history and these things. I mean, that's really where we're going. And, and it just lends to, you, you know, Rashad, who's going to come up next and talk about AI as well. I mean, all of this is just, you, you know, a perfect, um, and I won't call it storm, perfect rainbow coming together. <laughs> yeah, just to add to that question, uh, Matt and team. So I too believe continued use of APIs uh, for faster innovation. Um, also open framework access to machine learning data models and finally the shift to cloud first or cluster based architectures uh, help to make all this happen um, open access to models um, or those machine machine learning models allow organization to adopt custom uh, algorithms to their attack uh, surfaces if you will and then cloud and cluster based uh, excuse me cloud and cluster based operational platforms allow for detection and response uh, solutions to be developed faster on top of those uh, employing more scalable and resilient systems. So I think collectively as we, we grow uh, and these two worlds come together um, and we try to shift to uh, faster new real-time detection exposure to data, those are uh, key elements as well. Yeah, I thought um, after we started sol seeing the solar wind, solar gate, whatever name we're gonna use, uh, depending on what vendor you tie yourself closely to, um, right? I saw Exabeam very quickly come out and say, hey, we saw the patterns, we saw the lateral movement, we saw, right, Microsoft has published a great article about taking the on-premise OAuth, OAuth and um, federation keys, though it was getting stolen, seeing it coming from other parts of the world with the same keys or quickly adding a new federation provider. And Exabeam, like within a couple of days of some of those reports coming out, were immediately updating their rule sets and rule engines and able to tell customers hey, this happened to you, right? And also that immediately got put into the platform that protected people, right? It's, it's sadly the same things we've been doing for decades with, I hate to say it, right? Virus protection on our desktops, but coming to your enterprise services and tools um, that has made things extremely powerful. Um, and I think at, going back to some of the standards, the new uh, continuous access evaluation protocol that I will say, every single vendor on this board is supporting or on the board to start supporting um, as it's being finalized, right? The ability to have the different pieces of your organization actually tip off your access control systems and say, hey, there's something going on odd with this person. It gives us an endpoint to tip it off and turn things off immediately without having to build these integrations, right? So LDAP's been around for 20 plus years. Frank talked about Skim and the RESTful APIs the OAuth APIs, and now we're bringing that continuous access evaluation capability. <laughs> I'm excited for the next 10 years of identity and access management and where we're going. Um, I love this industry as I think everybody knows, but we're starting to be able to do some really cool stuff to make it super hard on the bad guys, um, more than just promises and fluff that we've talked about in the past.
Um, so I guess along those lines, Frank, um, SailPoint has invested heavily into AI and machine learning um, with, right, and being able to pull some of um, the typical slow role management we've done on premises, looking at the peer analysis through your autonomous identity and intelligence insight products. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how SailPoint is using those products to better enable customers to protect themselves and be more secure? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, typical day of the life, right, is, you know, we're used to having birthright provisioning and, and access requests and things like that with a policy model or an access model um, based on roles. Um, and we're not going to get away from those anytime soon, right? Um, we'd all love to, but we're just not there yet as, as, as an industry. Um, so as we deal with this, we have to figure out a way to fit in this, um, this zero trust model better, right? Identity has finally gotten its seat at the zero trust table. It's beyond the device, beyond just access. It really has become, we need to manage the identity better. So some of the investments we've made um, are focused around making the identity lifecycle process autonomous, making recommendations faster, understanding our organizations and our roles and, and our access model better. Um, so we're doing this through access history. So as we see access history or access history change over time, um, there can be some good tidbits of alerts in there. Why is someone's access changing? Are they headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? Um, when we look at peer group analysis, you know, one of the major um, problems with role-based access management is one, building the model. And, you know, as soon as you build that model, one thing changes and that model's destroyed. It's, there's a Greek mythology, um, you know, the guy that pushed the, the boulder up the hill um, every day and he got to the top, the boulder would roll down and the next day he'd start pushing the boulder again. Um, that's, that's role management. Um, so we're making that autonomous or, or headed that way where we're looking at, at peer groups, we're looking at access of entitlements and building these cluster groups and as cluster groups change, make recommendations to change those cluster groups of access. Um, and then also in, you know, we're in the government, we need access approvals. We're not going to get away from that um, too easily. And while we still have these humans in, in, in the process of making an approval decision, whether it's new access or review access or removing access, using AI in that same set of data, the access, hitter, access histories, the peer group analysis, the insights, all together to give the approver a better chance of making a better yes, no answer. Um, so it's just going to continue to grow the use cases for, for identity data and analytics um, will continue to evolve. And they're evolving at the pace where um, the zero trust world can't deny um, the analytics that, you know, between user behavior analytics and, and what we're doing in identity analytics, that it's not absolutely um, the foundation of, of zero trust. Matt, you're on mute. Might help if I actually took myself off. Yeah, um, one of the that's been one of the really cool benefits I've seen for customers in the last year with the um, AI and machine learning, both on the XBeam and the SailPoint side, is um, from an access certification perspective. Right, we've all had that access certification where you've got hundreds of people that need to be approved. And SailPoint um, about a year, year and a half ago started saying, okay, based on peer group analysis. Here's the 20%-ish, right? You could tweak those up and down of, here's all the people that look the same, but you can pretty much ignore the rest of these. And then in the last, really it's been, it's six, nine months being able to pull. So that was great because we knew what people looked like towards their peers, but then we were able to start bringing in the data from Exabeam of, okay, they look like their peers, but they use that stuff 10X more than the next person. And right, so we've got the, not only how, you compare to what everyone else has, but how are you also using it in comparison? So we're really able to pre-delegate those certifications and go, you might've had 300 users last quarter, this quarter, here's the 20 people that you really need to pay attention about. 
and it just makes things so much more powerful and actually makes people pay attention to security and doing the right thing versus just blanket saying done. So um, I guess Wade, we've um, we just had the second question pop up folks. So feel free to plug your answers in, but um, Radiant has been pivotal for many more organizations not only on premises and bringing their identity and access management data together to be used, but also as people have moved out into the cloud environments and now we're gonna see the continued cloud smart hybrid operations uh, across the government. Can you talk a little bit of some of the challenges that Radiant and the tools have been helping customers with and how they've enabled them to operate in a hybrid world more securely? Oh, definitely. And I think you keyed on the, the key word there, which is hybrid. Um, if you go back far enough to the beginning of the cloud, you'll find large organizations saying they're never going to move to the cloud. They don't trust it. Then there was a wave of we're cloud only and everything is going to the cloud. We're leaving behind our on-premise. I think everyone's realized now we're going to be in a hybrid world. You're going to have things that are going to remain on-premise. You're going to have applications and sources of identity and, and systems that are going to be on-premise. And then you're going to have a cloud uh, infrastructure. And it's working across those two worlds that's the challenge for organizations. And if you look at the underlying layer for, for those challenges, it's identity information. I can move an application up into the cloud, but I need to bring with it the identities that I need. I need to bring my governance processes and my log analysis and, and my access controls with me so that users coming in from the internet into a hybrid cloud model get the same level of control and management as the people that were doing that on-premise activity but at the same time, I need to make sure that I'm moving the right information in the right locations. And I may have multiple sources of truth now. I may have data in the cloud that I need to enhance locally in the cloud to use for certain operations that I don't need on-premise. I may have on-premise data that I need to share with my cloud organizations and my cloud applications. And I need to be able to move that data freely across those borders in a seamless manner. And that's what Radiant Logic gives you is an abstraction layer that disconnects you or decouples you from the infrastructure you're on. Radiant Logic doesn't know if you're sitting in the cloud or you're sitting on premise. For us, it's identity data. You provided it to us, we processed it, we delivered it, and it can be ubiquitous available everywhere and across multiple clouds now. So we see more and more customers that are in Amazon, they're in Azure, they're in Google, all for different purposes, but it's the same people or some subset of the same people that are accessing those resources so I need to make that information available and control it, but also then turn around and expose all those actions back to my management plane so that the Exabeam can see what people are doing in all these environments. So SailPoint can enforce the policies across those environments and create a, a universal or a global view that's really platform agnostic at that point and, and doesn't rely on a location for the way that operates. Yeah, it's been uh, not not a simple uh, problem to solve, but Radiant definitely is making it a lot easier. Um, so Wes, we've seen um, we're just over a year from all having this COVID work from home hybrid environment. Um, so not only do we have hybrid clouds, but extremely hybrid working environments that we're trying to work with it as well at the same time. Um, I know a ton of the work that Ping has been doing with customers over the last year has been helping them move to work from home environments out of the traditional office silos um, of the past, which forced many organizations to push many of the zero trust uh, concepts to the forefront. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about how the last year's been, some of those challenges that you've helped customers overcome and kind of where we are today and what you think's next for access control across sure. our organizations? Sure, so I mean, I think, you know, we've covered a lot of the basics of zero trust and what people had to do was they had to say, what controls and what context um, would make me comfortable exposing these assets which previously were behind a firewall or accessible via v VPN only to identities on the internet? And we've talked about them already, you know, strong authentication, device posture, um, you know, IP reputation, all of those things. Um, I think one of the, the newer things to, you know, ping that we put a lot of work into as well as our customers are starting to also um, get excited about is being able to also look at the actual data. 
So for example, yes, you have access to a particular kind of record, but if the record is um, specific to the EU, when you're trying to access it from outside of the EU, maybe you can't get to it. Or maybe you're ref you know, going through a bunch of um, press releases or documents or something, but one of them contains a topic that is embargoed from release um, you know, for another three weeks or until somebody consents. So not only looking at the roles, but actually looking at the actual data itself is I think an additional aspect of context that has really helped a lot of our customers strengthen their posture. Because not only are they able to say, I know who can get to things, but I also know what very fine grained aspects, <clears throat> excuse me, of those resources people should be able to see or should be redacted or potentially just even blocked. So when you add them all together, you've got, like I said, the ability to build something where people are confident that they are only allowing access when it makes sense without unnecessarily burdening every user. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> everyone's uh, home network has become an attack point very quickly and building that trust and whether you're at home in the coffee shop on a plane or crossing the border to get the heck out of ho home for a little while, um, it's, it's all becoming more, has become much more complex, but things definitely making it a lot easier. Um, so one of the things that um, we really haven't talked about, and some might say is more on the traditional side of identity and access management, but I don't think we, as an identity and access industry, have done a great job solving it yet, um, is the insider threat and lateral movement within networks and being able to see that I might have logged into my VPN as one account, I SSH'd into a different account, I sudoed into an account, I dropped privs by suing from root into another account, SSH over to another box and we've completely lost track of who's actually logging into that box over there from where and who. Um, and that's actually one of the places Exabeam has, um, I'll just say it soared um, <laughs> in terms of that uh, verbiage, but, um, and figuring out with the bad behavior and being able to track um, nefarious users back. Rashad, can you talk to us a little bit about Exabeam secret sauce and how you guys are able to do that so effectively. Um, and then some of the actions that have been built out over the last year within Exabeam that can be taken within the ICAM systems to mitigate those threats. Sure, I'll extend upon some of the session activity I talked about in the earlier comment. Um, so insider threats can be detected by understanding you know, how machines and uh, humans normally behave, as you know. Um, insider threats may touch many systems as you just you know, gave a description of you know, switching accounts, SSH, et cetera. Uh, to detect that su uh, such activity within Exabeam, uh, we'll collect log data um, integrated through um, different log silos throughout the open organization, um, integrate with ICAM data points, uh, and then employ baselining techniques. Um, we talked about peer group analysis, that's one technique we'll employ, also along with histogram shaping um, and some under, uh, underlying categorical um, and different types of uh, machine learning uh, techniques that we employ. Uh, once normal data is established within Exabeam, um, you know, data models, if you will, um, Exabeam's rule detection engine will evaluate conditions that represent activities of an insider threat, if you will. All those activities are then placed into an Exabeam smart timeline with context uh, known as a, a, a session object, that's what we refer to it as. And within that session object, um, abnormal activity, uh, whether it's malicious insider compromise credentials or an external threat, whatever it may be, is scored within a subset of risk points based on the activity of a user or entity has performed. Um, so think of the, the daily life of that user and that activity that we're capturing and, and baseline and comparing that baseline to our machine learning um, techniques, statistical uh, techniques under the hood. Um, the Exabeam session objects, then, um, you know, they'll provide all that data to the end user, um, you know, the, with the risk reasons, and we'll stitch all the event data, you know, providing all the host to IP mapping and assigning those risk reasons um, and scores uh, to, um, you know, help uncover lateral movement or activity, if you will, indicative of insider threat. Um, if a session um, has an aggregate score of 90 or higher, we deem that as a notable session. Um, you know, one key critical piece with Exabeam uh, we're not relying on static or predefined rules to detect insider threats. Um, it's all about data models for us, machine learning, statistical analysis, uh, going back to that baseline uh, behavior uh, profile, if you will. Along with um, that not being relying on uh, the predefined or can uh, correlation uh, you know, rules, this allows us to um, you know, scale from 
uh, under, you know, seeing new security attack net, uh, techniques from both the inside or external. Um, and the data, you know, we're able to, um, you know, determine day-to-day -day legitimate activity uh, versus abnormal activity, which occurs, you know, heavily throughout the uh, IT operational environment. Um, and then finally, I think your last question was in regards to some of the integrations with ICANN. So here today we have cell point, um, you know, one activity that we could do is uh, present that notable session in the context and the response action within the ICAM solution within cell point uh, specifically is we can pass notable sessions um, as a candidate for mediation um, and then actions to disable an account of interest could take place uh, through such an integration. Yeah, that's uh, so third question just popped up folks. Um, also, um, we would love to answer your the questions from the audience as well. Um, this is some pretty deep technical nerdy topics. Um, get into some nuts and bolts. So anywhere we haven't been clear, anywhere you want cl clarifications, any problems you've got, please feel free to put it in the chat window and we'll, um, we'll try and stump the panel. Um, so yeah, Rashad, one of the really interesting things we were able to do for a customer was see not only that the risk scores were increasing, but then give, notifications to the managers that said, hey, this person compared to all the people that report to you is acting a little bit funny. Not only are they different to their peers, but also they're different to their normal behavior. And immediately kick off a certification in SailPoint that said, we're gonna hold you accountable as the manager, go look at the dashboard, look at what they've done in the last couple of weeks, look at the events that have caused this to raise up, but as the manager, we're going to hold you accountable and actually make you certify their access or use SailPoint to take some things away for a certain period of time until you have an opportunity to go talk to them and really understand what's going on. And um, just that ability to bring some of that visibility to the line level managers, because we all know the SOC analysts are, as I call it, looking for needles in a needle stack and <laughs> don't, have, don't really know what these people are supposed to be doing. And raising that out to the managers is just really changed how the organizations are thinking about security um, and making it everyone's problem to solve like we've been trying to do for over a decade. Um, so I'm gonna call a little bit of an audible. Um, I think we can all tell um, that this is a little bit of a geekier side of the panel. Um, so with the identity and access management, the SOC, user behavior analytics, all of this coming together, what are each of you all excited about? for the next, we'll call it three to five years, because anything beyond that is, uh, we're gonna have flying cars finally, right? <laughs> so um, I'll start left to right on my screen. Frank, what are you excited for? Yeah, you, you know, I think I think this webinar um, with with our great, you know, team that we've, we've kind of developed here where we've come together as vendors, um, you know, five years ago, this probably wouldn't have happened. Ten years ago, it definitely wouldn't have happened. Um, you, you know, and and I think I think industry needs to continue to do this, right? Um, we need to pull up our big boy pants, and and really understand. We need to make these things easier for customers. And you, you know, I I think that's probably what drives me on a daily basis. I mean, Matt, you kind of exposed. We've known each other for ten years. Um, I'll add another 15 to that, that I've been doing identity in the federal government. And I've watched a lot of maturity and, and really, you know, as I've seen this, you know, back from way back when, when we were first considering CAC in, in DOD um, in the late 90s um, to where we're at today. And, you know, it's the growth that really keeps me going. Um, it's the maturity. Yeah, it's slow. Yeah, it's painful. But, you know, I feel like, you know, on a daily basis, I get up to make the government successful. Um, and, you know, I think we'll continue to see changes in industry, technology, um, you know, that are just going to continue to allow us to do our jobs better as security practitioners um, to make our customers successful. So we'll go next to Rashad. What are your thoughts? You're probably coming from a very different part of the industry and your thoughts on how this is all going to come together. So I'm excited to hear what your thoughts are. Okay, putting me on the spot there. So I uh, just from a maturity aspect of what we're talking about today, you know, the ICANN integration with 
uh, UEBA or the ARI Olympic space. Uh, I, I'm just excited to see where that's going to go. Um, kind of think of the movie Minority Report where they did all the uh, crazy stuff on the screen. Uh, hopefully one day we get to that point where these uh, you know, solutions bolstered, you know, come together, uh, you know, with continuous development through the open API integration things that we talked about, where we're able to scale um, and, and just uh, at the click of a button, take of action, have a full remind, minority report of everything that's going on and be able to mitigate that, uh, you know, in a much faster uh, space and time than what we do today. Uh, we're making great progress today um, in that space, but, you know, yeah, that would be kind of on my uh, bucket list or, if you will, to see in the future. I think uh, Frank already said he's got 15 years at least doing this in the industry. And I think, Rashad, you're probably closer to me. So let's hope we get it fixed <laughs> by uh, the time Frank retires, for sure, by the time we do it. <laughs> well, I was so, adding 15 to our already 10, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were still in high school. <laughs> uh, so, Wade, what are your thoughts? Radio brings a very unique perspective to this, being able to connect everything the way it does. Yeah, well, in terms of what I'm excited about, and actually, you know, if, we, if we're looking at it right now, we've achieved uh, video phones, which was something that 20 years ago we were supposed to have any minute. So I'm, I'm hopeful for flying cars. I think it's around the corner. Uh, um, but in terms of, of identity management, what I'm actually excited about is that we have as an industry now a buzzword that actually has a chance to impact everyone and increase security, and that's the zero trust architecture. Um, it, it's still early in the, in the growth and in the option, but we have people committed to customers. We have vendors as the folks on, on these screens are committed to it, to supply the architecture that's necessary to deliver that idea of zero trust. And I think as we move in that direction, as we get towards applications that understand the granularity necessary to deploy a zero trust architecture from end to end, we're gonna see a monumental shift in the level of security we can deliver to customers and the amount of assurance we can des design into the applications and into the infrastructure. And that again, for us is exciting because it, it builds the value of all of our solutions, the ability to, to have a rich, full contextual view of the user to make really granular decisions about their access and be confident in the right user doing the right things at the right time but also be able to do enough behavior and analytics and, and collect enough behavioral data to be able to recognize that anomaly when it happens. Now you mentioned it, you know, on a day one, you can do peer comparisons. And now we're getting closer and closer to those things where we can actually look at someone's daily activities and predict reliably what they should be doing and notice when they're not, or it's not them. Uh, the one I go back to is the, uh, the water company in, in Florida, right around the, uh, the Super Bowl, where their water system was hacked and somebody was changing the uh, sodium uh, carbonate in, uh, parts per billion on the water, poisoning the water, basically. Uh, luckily, a, an attendant was sitting there watching his screen be moved by somebody else. But if we were gotten to a point of behavior analytics and, and implemented that platform there on, on that level, the system itself would have recognized this is an anomaly outside of the scope. I've got controls in my policy enforcement engine that says, no, you can't do this. And that would have been halted right on the screen, regardless of how compromised the external system may have been. So I'm really excited that we're moving towards that model where we're going to be able to build in levels of assurance that are dreamed about today that are really within reach, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as you said, right. That I think we'll get to the user models very quickly, but the non-person entity models will be very fast behind it because of the way we've modeled that data, um, right? Wes, you, you all at Ping already have a very strong API um, protection tool to do some of that stuff. Um, and I've seen it deployed and within days, like patterns are already being applied that are stopping things in real time. like. In, I'm not going to kiss your butt, but like incredibly impressive stuff in the field that we would not have detected in the past. What are you excited about though? <laughs> so as we've talked about, there's, well, I said a couple different things and there are different corners, but they all sort of coalesce together. And, and one of them is, as we talk about um, 
UEBA or any sort of probabilistic analysis, you know, which is like what ping intelligence is, you're looking for patterns and you're looking, there's certain things which are indications of compromise that are clear, like, you know, access tokens suddenly zooming across 15 different IP ranges. But, you know, attackers are also getting smarter. There's a little bit of a spy versus spy thing going on. But one of the things that has also made me happy is that customers are getting comfortable with tools that are probabilistic. Because three years ago, when you talk to a customer and they say, well, when is it going to trigger? Um, you know, as, as in not under what conditions, as in when, it's like, well, I don't know. You know, you have to have 72 different conditions come together with tunable confidence factors. And at that point, they were just hearing the Charlie Brown parents talking, you know, wah, wah, wah. And, and now they get it that everything, frankly, is probabilistic. I mean, you're probably Matt, but you know, the, Matt could have been replaced by a space alien yesterday and you know, you're just doing a good job. So what is your level of confidence and either that something is what they, it says it is, or frankly, that something's wrong and then you should ana analyze it or, or block on it or whatever. So that whole just getting more, customers getting more comfortable with that is important. The other ones is, the, you know, I'll, I'll put a plug in there for a one of the standards, the, the small miracle that is, you know, FIDO and WebAuthn, where you now have in your phones an authenticator that uses biometrics, it's low friction, and can actually prevent people from doing what they actually wanted to do, which was to enter their credentials on a phishing site, <laughs> you know, and, and so that's a big lift. And, and so the improvement in security around that is, you know, not to be, you know, trivialized. And then last but not least, just to sort of riff on a point that Frank made is that the standards continue to evolve. To evolve. They continue to take us to newer and better places. I mean, for a couple of years ago, it was weird. I think we reached that lull point where it was like, it didn't feel like a lot was going on. And now I just see a huge acceleration. You know, I think one of the, you guys had talked about CAPE and risk, a, a, a way we can all collaborate on signals. There's things like fast fed where you can very easily set up a secure connection for provisioning or for single sign on without having to be, you know, the business expert. There's all kinds of ways of getting more, uh, you know, contextual data with PAR and RAR. So once again, the standards bodies are looking at what people need and want to do. And, you know, we're all sitting there, you know, I, I, I sit on a bunch of the committees with, you know, my brethren from SailPoint and everywhere else. Um, and, and we're looking to make people's lives better, but also to cooperate, you know, in the best possible way between our products. So I think you'll continue to see that evolution of new ways that we can collaborate and add value because of these emerging and, and you know, uh, maturing standards. So that's the things that excite me right now. Yeah. So I'm going to build off a little bit of that. We had a question come in from Fidel um, about I am is predicated on unsolvable math problems, right? At the end of the day, the encryption we use, the, um, right? What happens, and we've already seen it, right? Our keys keep getting stronger. They keep, the digits keep getting longer. Um, if some of those problems get solved and the hardware side gets to a point where we can start solving these things extremely fast and we essentially lose trust in those pack based authenticators that we've built many of the government things on. Um, Wes, I think you're by far the best answer to this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, certainly as people look at things like blockchain, you know, don't put anything on the blockchain that you're not willing to make public because people have all of time and compute resources to crack it. So along that line of thinking, you look at how much data do I have? How secure is that data? And, and how, do I, how long do I want to hang on to it or render it invalid? And there are ways to re-encrypt stuff. One of the things we're actually working on is you know, having distributed identity. So if you don't want information stored centrally and you've got appropriate secure enclaves that can be trusted by you know, third parties, you store it locally. So, you know, if people can't get to it, they can't crack it. And you're exchanging it, you know, one time in a, you know, sort of transitional manner where it's not persisted anywhere except between you and the other guy. And hopefully the other guy's smart enough to get rid of it as soon as they've acted on it. Um, which I think is also a good thing for anybody out there is first rule of security is people can't steal from you things you didn't 
hold on to in the first place. So don't hold on to data excessively. Think about what your data retention policy is and what you truly need. Um, so that's really how I answer that. Yes, how do we, you know, when we get to quantum, you know, computing and we can crack all of the um, ECC curves and everything, we will evolve both to better encryption as well as being smarter about not having the data hang around for as long. So that's really my perspective. So we'll just add more math problems to the math problems to make it harder well, to solve them. <laughs> there are a lot of surprising people. I mean, I, I'm in Boston. Um, we come out of MIT, but you know, Stanford generates a few too who love solving hard math problems. So we got to give them something to do moving forward. Uh. <laughs> I think Matt too, that that same question, there's, there's something I'm starting to see now coming out of the DOD, which is the concept of, of build up, tear down. Don't leave data laying around for someone to find over a period of time. I have a mission, it's got a duration. I build my environment for the mission. I operate that mission, I tear it all down and it never existed. And now my attack surfaces have gotten much smaller. I can spend more time building very tight controls around my centralized data that I build from, but I'm not distributing it and copying it everywhere, leaving telltale sets of it around for people to attack. So that seems to be another paradigm where that can apply in, in many scenarios where I start to look at just on time data uh, provided for a purpose and then taken away when it's no longer needed. Yeah. Yeah, that, absolutely. Um, so as we're getting towards the end here, I'm going to throw one question out. Um, we were actually all on a recent customer call uh, where we presented the combined architecture and the person on that the customer side said, wow, you guys really do have the zero trust reference architecture for the federal government already put together. And like, I know Frank and I both kind of went, yeah, I guess you're right. Like it doesn't hit us that way. Um, and this kind of goes back to some of the other things we've said in the past of there's a ton of building blocks already within the organizations that we all support, whether it's from the vendors that are here on the panel today or other ones that do similar things. Um, so don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and just say, I, we're gonna replace everything because we have to go to zero trust. A lot of organizations already have those building blocks in place. Don't let some vendor tell you, we're gonna spend three years replacing everything and promise us it'll work then. Um, so I guess bringing that back a little bit is as organizations are moving forward with the zero trust model, uh, the beyond corp, beyond prod models, um, what is one piece of advice that each of you would give to people watching this webinar who are starting down that path to make sure they're starting off on the right foot. So again, we'll start left to right on my screen, Frank. Yeah, <clears throat> and you know, I think you nailed it, Matt. Um, I, I think in our industry, we've been saying, you know, as identity practitioners, we've been thinking the identity is the center of security for quite some time. Um, you know, to hear to hear the rest of the security community say identity is the new perimeter is actually a, a, you know, a tip of the hat to all of us. Um, but, you know, to get started in, and I know Wade's gonna jump on this one, um, it's all about the data, right? It's all about the identity data. We can't get to dynamic authorization of any format with any kind of confidence unless the data we're using in those policies is current, accurate, audited, controlled, and, and really that's the foundation. Um, so, you know, my, my recommendation, in, and I've heard this on calls with Department of Defense, federal civilian, the intelligence community, you know, I, I work globally. So, you know, literally I had this conversation in Australia last night about, you know, the processes, the controls, the policies um, are only as good as your data is. Um, if you're saying blue shirt lets me in, you better ensure that I'm wearing a blue shirt every day. Um, if something about me changes, then my access needs to change too. Um, so that's going to be my, my leave behind is, yes, the identity is the new perimeter, and it's all about how we use the data, and the data is accurate. Amen to that. My history for identity was uh, data warehousing. So um, if today is blue shirt day. Rashad and I both messed up because we've got the black shirts on. Um, so we'll go to Rashad next um, to talk about um, his thoughts on zero trust and how to move forward. 
Yeah, so as you look at zero trust, um, from, you know, particularly from a UEBA perspective, uh, from that lens, I would suggest you, your architecture integrates with an analytic solution uh, that has the ability to show normal uh, behavior. That is very critical and crucial. Um, in addition to showing normal, um, those uh, chosen solutions should have the ability to execute actions that we talked about before the integrations with sale point, um, you know, because responding to a threat is not the end of the story. Or, you know, that's just part of the story. You have to be able to, or excuse me, um, detection is part of the story. Responding to the threat is the second part of that. You still need to be able to respond to your threats, you know, uh, and, and employ remediation techniques fairly fast. So those would be my two uh, takeaways as you're looking at a ZTA approach. You're on mute, Matt. <laughs> I'm just going to stay off mute at this point. I failed twice in the call. So Rashad, I'm going to ask you real quick. Um, when you all are going into new customers, um, right, majority of the time they either have Exabeam as a SIM product or another one of the competitors. When you're laying some of this uh, user behavior analytics, analytics tools on top, how quickly are you able to start seeing some of these changes that then can be used by the ICAM tools? Uh, right is it away. months? Is it no? It's, like it's, it's it's right away. So it's all dependent on how a bit, how fast they can get the data to us. Um, typically, you know, if we're looking at uh, two scenarios from a pilot perspective, you know, we want fourteen to thirty days of uh, baseline activity, if you will. Uh, we go into production. It's more on um, the thirty day side, but um, all that's catered upon how fast they can get the data to us. So if you look at it from a sim augmentation play, we can hook right on top of uh, some of the uh, you know the vendors out there like Splunk, et cetera, sit on top of those, make an API call. They, they already have, you know, months and years of data. As soon as we can pull that data in, we can start to build the baseline and then automatically score, um, you know, within, you know, a couple of hours. Yeah. So, I mean, sadly, or amazingly enough, right. You can get the data pulled in from however long the history is from those SIM tools. You can get the, what the people have been granted access to data from sale point within the same amount of time, as quick as you can shove the data over an API and then use Radiant Logic to expose that data. So Wes and the ping team can actually use it to start enforcing policies literally in like days. <laughs> like the insanity that we can actually say that today <laughs> is that awesome. Back, that goes back to my minority <laughs> report wish list, right? Yeah, rapid response, so. Yeah, so good, Wade, uh, Wade, I think Frank stole your thunder uh, because it's always been all about the data um, and getting it right. But what are your thoughts? Well, I will give a shout out to Frank to, to thank him for pointing that out. And again, I, I agree that um, having the right information is critical. But I'll also say for people that are looking at a zero trust architecture, as you mentioned earlier, take a look around at what you have already. If you're looking at the folks on the screen, you, if you've got an IGA platform like SailPoint in place, you've got a big chunk of this available to you already. If you've got uh, same systems that are pulling in log data and correlating that, building this data lake of audit trails, you've got the fuel for Exabeam to start doing things day one. Um, if you've got ping in place already, you've got a, a, a uh, enforcement tool uh, to be able to, to take this information and act on it at the perimeter uh, very quickly. So it's a journey. You're not going to do zero trust uh, day one but you've already got pieces to play with. You're not looking at uh, start over, you're looking at how do I take what I have, integrate it more efficiently, and then enrich it as I go along. How do I add, what pieces am I missing? Where am I weak? How can I fill that data in? Do I need more sources of identity data integrated into my platform? Do I need a better set of policies for, for my access control? Do I wanna expand my access management layer to more applications and more customers? And then move this as a, as a journey uh, as opposed to just a, a one-time process, because this is a continuous improvement model that as the technology improves and your implementation improves, your results will improve. And that's available to everybody, even wherever you're starting today. Perfect. And Wes, I will let you wrap us up. I'll, yeah, unfortunately, Wayne mostly was looking inside my head. It's the same thing. It's a journey. <laughs> Think of it as a staircase. You're rarely starting from scratch. Where, what are the rickety steps, you know, fix those up, you know, the weakest steps and then go back and, and build the really cool granite staircase. Don't just try to start from, you know, net zero unless you really have to. So that's it for me. Awesome. Well, we just hit the three o'clock number right on the nose. I know I had a ton of fun chatting with everybody today. Thank you everybody for your time. 
thank you, Katie and Karasoff for bringing us all together to talk about what I really am excited to see for the next five years. Um, I came about this excited when I started in the industry with the hopes and the dreams, and it's happy to actually see them coming true. Um, albeit a decade later, these next five years are going to be a ton of fun for all of us, um, really just helping our customers be able to protect themselves in ways that they never thought possible before. So thank you again, everybody, for your time today. Um, feel free to, anyone who, um, participants, put in more questions. We're more than happy to follow up afterwards, and the Kerasoft team will aggregate those and make sure you get your questions answered. So again, thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. I'd like to thank all of our participants for being here today, as well as Frank, Wes, Wade, Rashad, and Matt. We hope the information you received today during the webinar has been helpful for you and your organization. As a reminder, everyone who received will receive a recording of the presentation and a follow-up email. And for those who met CPE requirements today, you will receive your certificate of completion within two weeks. Please take a moment to fill out the survey on your browser once the webinar ends. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to call or email us. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.